and um, our next speaker is Das Schwarzmann from the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering of Princeton University, and he will speak about causality and de developmental abnormal of abnormalities associated with mutations in cell signaling signaling systems. <laughs> the floor is yours. Thank you. So it's a, it's a pleasure to be here again. So I will tell you about the work um, that we have been doing for quite some time now, trying to understand um, uh, necessary and sufficient conditions in developmental disorders. I will explain what I mean by this. And the story that I brought today is um, very short and hopefully very simple. So this is the work that's done by the postdoc in my lab, Rob Marmion, uh, two graduate students, Meta Barrett and Alison Simpkins, and it just attended last week. Susan Guzman is a technician in the lab, Jody Schottenfeld is a colleague, gave us some expertise, and Jody Schottenfeld is my own time collaborator. Okay, so why are we working on uh, developmental disorder? So the first answer to this question is that, that they're quite common, so uh, somewhere between 5 and 10 percent of all uh, children of one or the other developmental abnormality. And they can range from any kind of morphological uh, uh, difference or interaction to something behavioral, and these, are, these things can have different points of onset, they have long-lasting consequences for families, for affected uh, individuals. Uh, there is very limited funding for studies of developmental abnormalities. In fact, if you look in the US, the poorest of the NIH institutes is the one that has to do with child health uh, in development. There is a small number of cases, so because of this, it's, it's hard to study this. Um, uh, it is also very difficult, so pharma pharma pharmaceutical companies are also not interested uh, in these conditions because a lot of the drugs, while a lot of the drugs can be repurposed, this is a new indication that can be added to already an existing drug. And with every new indication, the price of the drug is dropping. So, uh, so there are many reasons to be interested in this, just because the powers that we are not working on. So somebody, somebody should be working on it. And uh, there is little funding. There is even less quantitative understanding. I think we need to understand uh, what goes wrong in um, any of these conditions. So these are all. Uh, medical or applied reasons to be interested in imperfections in development. But the reason that I find the most compelling is the, is, um, has been stated by Harvey, due to whom, because of whom we know about circulation. One can argue that he was one of the first, that he was the first quantitative biologist. So I really love this quote, and he says, nature is nowhere accustomed more openly to display her secret mysteries than in cases where she shows traces of the workings apart from the deep <laughs> So, of course, geneticists in the audience are not surprised by this quote, right? So we learned how development works by looking at mutants. So it's from mutant analysis, and not only development, it's starting from the working phage uh, in bacteria, we learn how uh, the systems perform their functions, looking at what happens when we break this or the other part of the system. So our understanding of regulation biology relies on mutations, but these were extremely strong perturbations. These were very strong loss of functions or very strong uh, gain of functions perturbations that really pushed the system out of its comfort zone. Okay, and the cell was there. So the mutations that we are interested in are very different. So these are very mild mutations, and nevertheless, they can cause a phenotype. And it's these kinds of effects that I want to discuss with you today. So um, I have been interested in starting to work in developmental abnormalities for, for a long time. It wasn't clear how to start. So we decided to start working on monogenic developmental abnormalities. So these are the conditions that, are, that can be caused, or are believed to be caused, by mutation in a single gene. There is plenty of abnormalities like this. We work with a particular class uh, that is observed approximately in one uh, in a thousand of birds. And uh, these conditions are associated with coding variations in components of a highly conserved signaling pathway, something that's called RAS <coughs> signaling pathway. This is a signal transduction cassette that is present everywhere from this to humans. So there is a, to a first approximation, you can say that there is a linear sequence of protein-protein interactions and phosphorylation reactions that are initiated at the plasma membrane of the cell, leads to activation of one kinase, the second kinase, 
the third kinase, once the third kinase is activated, it starts phosphorylating transcription factors, regulators of metabolism, regulators of cytoskeleton, and in this way, an extracellular signal can control what is happening inside the cell. So this pathway is highly conserved. Uh, th there is extreme similarity in the coding sequences of the, um, of the genes all across uh, eukaryotes. All right. So the diseases that we are interested in are caused by um, uh, missense mutations in uh, components of the signaling pathway. So this signaling pathway is very famous because the components of the, this pathway are mutated in cancer. So there are hundreds of mutations, or even more, that have been identified in different people with different types of tumors. Because of its important cancer, there has been lots of analysis of the molecules that comprise the pathway. Because of this, we learned, I mean, this is the royal, we learned uh, a lot about the cell biology of the system, about the biochemistry, to the point that we have structures and we have drugs. So our idea was to start with this information, about how this pathway is working. And this is really a collective effort of uh, people who are working from yeast and C. elegans, uh, human cancer lice, flies, worms, and so on, and combine this with the knowledge of biochemistry to try to understand how known mutations in known signaling proteins and a known signaling pathway disrupt development. Okay, so how do these people look like? So this pathway is involved in essentially all steps of embryonic development from the first cleavages in the embryo to postnatal development. So it's not surprising that because this pathway is involved in so many critical steps of development and because all components of this pathway are ubiquitously expressed. So we are not talking about transcription factors that are expressed in a spatial and temporal regulated manner. So these are the components of the pathway that are present in every single cell in the organism and are just waiting to be activated by an extracellular signal. So it's not surprising that when such component is mutated, there are defects in multiple aspects of development. And indeed, individuals with these uh, mutations, they display a complex, or, or so these are what's called syndromic uh, abnormalities. So they have uh, facial uh, dysmorphisms of the type that the faces are even more uh, asymmetric than usual. There is short stature. There, there is a specific class of congenital heart abnormalities. There is usually a neurocognitive delay predisposition to cancer. So these mutations are also gain of function mutations. I will explain what this means. Okay, so in contrast to what we heard from Adrian's talk yesterday, where uh, the red syndrome is called by a loss of function mutation, these missense mutations also give rise to a protein, but this protein is more active than usual. I will, I will explain in a second what this means. Okay. This is the way in which this pathway is working. All components are expressed all the time. So the relative concentrations can vary, but you can be certain that any single cell in the organism contains all components of this pathway. The pathway is inactive completely until one of cell, one of cell surface receptors is engaged by a ligand. So this can be fibroblast growth factor that binds to the fibroblast growth receptor, or EGF that binds to the epidermal growth factor receptor. When this happens, the pathway is engaged, uh, you assemble binary complexes, higher order complexes, and it leads to dual phosphorylation of this core component that's called NEC, which leads to the dual phosphorylation component of this core component that's called ERP. Once this is happening, the pathway is activated, there are lots of effects in a cell. There are there is the skeletal remodeling, there are transcriptional changes, changes in metabolism. We chose to work, and uh, mutations in any one of these components give rise to phenotypes that collectively are known as rasopathies. So these components are working together. The pathway has to be active. So mutations that make the pathway more active than usual give rise to similar phenotypes. So this is a classical genetic result. So we spent a lot of time thinking which component to start with, because we knew that there are plenty of uh, genes to work with. And for all of these genes, we have structures. We decided to work on NEC. NEC is a core component of the signaling pathway. And we thought that this would be the simplest enzyme to work with. Why is it the case? This is the case because in contrast to its effector, ERK, which has hundreds of substrates in a cell, NEC has one and only substrate, which is ERK. Okay. So this is an enzyme that is regulated. It is inactive until it is phosphorylated by RAF. Once it's phosphorylated, it phosphorylates ERK, 
the enzyme is also dephosphorylated, and it also binds to a handful of proteins. So we thought, how complicated can it be? So this is a, uh, what is called a Manhattan plot, similar to the one that um, Adrian showed me yesterday for um, MEC2, for mutations in the coding sequence in, 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 um, in the MEC protein. So mutations are scattered all throughout the enzyme. There are mutations that are associated with cancer, that are associated with developmental abnormalities. So mutations are within the kinase domain of a protein. Makes sense. The protein is a kinase, so mutations in the kinase domain should give rise to activation. And then there are mutations in a region that is called a negative regulatory part of the enzyme. Mutations are also present there. So this is only a partial view of mutations. So there are probably 150 mutations in just a single component. We selected a sequence, uh, a handful of these mutations, probably around 20. And we studied them for uh, you know, five or six years in this expression systems, and we studied them in the testing. So what did, we, what did we learn? So this is a summary of a lot of work of uh, several people in the lab. So the first thing that we learned is that in contrast to normal MEP that is completely silent in the absence of the extracellular signal, mutants that are associated with cancers and are associated with developmental abnormality have some lighting independent activity. And we even have some structural understanding of what is happening. So the wild type enzyme is flipping between inactive and active conformations. And phosphorylation shifts the equilibrium towards the active conformation, making it uh, enzymatically active. And the shift is very strong. So what is happening in the mutant is that this active part is populated even in the absence of phosphorylation. However, once phosphorylated, it, can, it works um, uh, as a lot of things. So the second thing that we learned, and this also can be done in a test tube by mixing inactive net with constitutively active RAF, we learned that the mutant forms can be activated faster by RAF. We know that this is happening in a test tube, and we know that this is something that is happening in vivo using these expression systems. We know that in contrast, for example, in contrast to wild type net, which requires this huge uh, adapter that, um, uh, that, that is sort of similar to Stereo 5 for people who um, understand how the yeast mechanics pathway is working, mutant net can be activated by RAF even in the absence of the adapter. So the wild type net is completely inactivatable by an extracellular signal in the absence of this adapter that's present in all uh, metazones. Mutant can be activated. And uh, of when it is fully active, it displays different changes in kinetic rate constants in the activation of carbon. So even though we chose a simple, uh, the simplest component of a signaling pathway, there is a multifactorial change in the property of the molecule. Okay? So uh, it is easier to activate. It is a little bit more active when it's active. It, it, is, it has a leaky performance. So one can study this in a test tube and in this expression assays for a very long time, and all of these are interesting questions. But the key question, of course, what are the organismal phenotypes once we understand molecular phenotypes? And I also want to tell you is that when you uh, ask these questions in highly controlled conditions of a biochemical experiment or a cell biological experiment, the answer is quantitative. The enzyme, the, the enzyme that was inactive is now active. The, the rate constant is twice as big. Okay, so what is happening in the organism where all of these effects are working at the same time? Okay. So um, this is this gets me back to the title of the talk when I say that there are necessary and sufficient conditions for these developmental abnormalities. So how do we know about these abnormalities in the first place? There is a group of people they display a similar class of defects. They are short, asymmetric faces, heart defects, the disposition to cancer. They are sequenced. These mutations are discovered. So this is what a mathematician would call a necessary condition. If they have a phenotype, they have this class of mutations. And this is how a clinician thinks. So this is how these people are diagnosed. It's not necessary. It can be other mutations. But this is how we know about these conditions in the first place. What we would like to understand is whether these mutations are also sufficient for inducing a phenotype. And this is a very relevant question. I don't think you need to be a mathematician to understand why this question is relevant. So what is known to clinical geneticists and developmental biologists is that exactly the same sequence variant can show strikingly different phenotypes in different individuals. 
Okay, so you can find, you can have two patients with very different types of facial asymmetry with different extent of a heart defect with one that will have predisposition to cancer, one that will not have predisposition to cancer. They will carry exactly the same variant. But, so what is the answer for this? So, a typical explanation is that um, there can be modifier effects, there can be environmental differences, okay? So what you would like to study, what you would like to do if you're interested in sufficient conditions for any of these other monitors, is that you would like to take a large group of uh, identical individuals so that your study is statistically powered, introduce one and only modification in the genome so that you know that the only nucleotide that you changed in this uh, code that Alex presented you with is the one that gives rise to the change in the enzyme and assay a whole bunch of phenotypes in the world. So this is impossible in humans. This is hard in mice, or either hard or expensive. So one, but one way or the other, it is, it is not straightforward. Done. So this is possible in flies. So um, a postdoc in the lab, Rob Marmion, is, uh, who actually happens to be my academic grandson, is a real artist with uh, introducing uh, very gentle modifications uh, in the Drosophila genome. He designed a strategy that allows you to introduce essentially any one of, of uh, missense mutations in the coding region of a fly gene so that we know that the only changes in the genome, there is a PAM uh, site and there is a nucleotide change that gives rise to the missense mutations, okay? So we have these mutations, um, so we introduce this in, a, in, in the Drosophila neck, in the Drosophila um, uh, DSOR, which is the only version of the MEC enzyme uh, in flies. And the first question was whether we would actually get flies that survive to adulthood. Maybe these perturbations are so strong that all embryos will die. Yes, we do. It was also possible that there would be no changes because um, these changes might be too subtle, maybe human uh, protein is a little bit different. So long story short, we now have both uh, wild type um, uh, flies, we have heterozygotes, we have homozygotes, and we can ask the question of what does this very subtle change in a genome do for any one of the uh, missense mutations that are seen in, as human phenotypes, okay? So the first thing that I will show you is an example of a molecular phenotype in the embryo. So uh, you have seen uh, fly blastoderms several times in this talk, so this is the blank canvas on which uh, this is, this is an embryo towards the end of the third hour of its development. So this is a blank canvas in which patterning is happening. There is an interior posterior system that depends on bicoid, dorsal ventral system that, uh, that depends on dorsal. And at the tips of the embryo, RAS pathway is activated, okay? So uh, receptor of this pathway is uniformly present. In this case, it's dorsal receptor tyrosine kinase. Active ligand is produced only at the poles of the embryo. So there is localized activation of the two tips of the embryo. This gives rise to the localized transcriptional response. And this localized transcriptional response is essential for building the anterior parts of the future brain and for, for constructing uh, the posterior mid depth of the fly. So this is a very nice system because in the same sample, we have a control where in the middle of the embryo, we have zero activation because you're far away from ligand and we have endogenous activation. So by bringing in a mutant, we can ask what is happening to the pathway in the absence of ligand activation and what is happening to the pathway in, and, and how does this mutation influence the response of the endogenous signal transduction pathway that contains a dozen or so proteins in response to a normal ligand. So we are studying mutations at their normal dosage, at the heterozygosity or homozygosity, in response to endogenous levels of ligand. So we don't have to serum starve the cells or we don't need to misexpress any component. Okay, so this is what we see. So these experiments are quantitative and controlled because we mix wild type and mutant embryos. We image them on the same microscope slide in the same imaging conditions. They're fixed and stained together in the same test tube. So this is a fly that, is, uh, that carries uh, a cancer mutation. Okay, so it's homozygous for this uh, specific sequence modification. So this is what we see. We see that at the poles of the embryo, there is slight activation of pathway activation. Okay. The effect is statistically significant, okay? So the p-value is very low, but between us, the effect is very subtle. So if you talk about the full change, we're talking maybe 20%. So we can measure it at heterozygosity, but the effect is very subtle, okay? In the middle of the embryo, there is also a statistically significant effect. 
But once again, the effect is very subtle. So the quantitative changes in signaling induced by these modifications are not enormous. So we are not talking about RASP12 that is associated with, uh, with cancer. So development is perturbed by very, 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 very small amounts. Maybe there are no consequences. It turns out that the answer is no. So this is how the embryo looks like at uh, the end of the third hour of development. So, what, so there is a quantitative change in the signaling pathway, but what happens to all the embryos? That will they develop or not? So the answer turned out to be very surprising. And this is the power of experiments that can be done in flies. So we can look at hundreds of embryos on a single plate that have been timed in their collection, and we can use a simple iPhone camera to watch their hatching uh, from the actual. And what we observe is that in contrast to wild type, where 90% of embryos hatch, and the ones that don't are usually associated with eggs that were not fertilized, here only 50% hatch. The ones that do hatch with a significant delay. So changes in signaling are subtle, but the effect is dramatic. So 50% of embryos die, 50% go on to hatch. This is a different mutation from the previous. This is, but it doesn't matter. They all look like this. Okay. So for this one, the effect would be, you know, 70%. Okay. So there are multiple stages of flight development. RAS is involved in all of them. So once the embryo, uh, embryogenesis is complete, the embryos that did not die, they become larvae. Lar lar larvae crawl ar around and eat, and they eventually pupate. So what we see is that in controls, 90% of larvae become pupae. Here, 60% become pupae. Okay. And the effect is slower, smaller in heterozygotes. Okay. So once again, organisms can fall off the development track at different point in trajectory. Okay. So these are the organismal phenotypes. What do we see? So we see that individuals are lost throughout development. So this is not surprising at all, because this pathway is involved in so many steps of embryonic development. Right. So if you look at FGF, it does neuronal patterning, limb growth, axis elongation, vertebrates, and the same story in all organisms that we study. So this is not surprising. So what does this mean? It means that humans that we see in the clinic are what geneticists call escapers. So these are the ones that managed to go through uh, development unscathed. Okay. Now, when we examine adults, so I, I decided not to put these slides, so adults contain a large number of external and readily examinable structures such as wings, eyes, leg bristles, all of which depend on rust signaling, they have very, very small defects, if any at all. So the only thing that we can measure with statistical significance, sometimes there is a ectopic posterior prostate. Nothing to worry about. Most of them even look normal. So taking a leap from fly to humans, what does this mean? It means that in the general population, there is a whole bunch of individuals that are completely normal, even though they have a mutation. And indeed, if you examine exomes that are present in um, UK Biobank, you see a lot of mutations in individuals that have absolutely no phenotypes. Okay? Now, so what actually, so this is the part that, um, uh, that is most, so now this is published, so I'm, I'm telling you, so you're the first audience to learn about. So we have some individuals that make it through development. We have those who do not make it through development. What is different between them? So um, this is not uh, a surprising observation. So this is known to any undergraduate student of development. There are conce uh, concepts of incomplete penetrance, expressivity. Okay? So and this is usually explained by genetic modifiers. So it's not surprising. You have every individual, if you look at humans, they have different mother and father. So they have the same mutation, but other uh, changes, variations in other positions in the genome can influence what is happening. So we work with a population of interbred flies, but even here, that it's a sexually reproducing population. We cannot guarantee the complete identity of the genomes. Okay, so there can be some variations. Okay. The other explanation is that there can be um, uh, variations due to environment. Okay. What does this mean? So it doesn't mean only that uh, people grow up in households with different incomes, eating different foods. Okay? This also means that even in the uterus, even when twins are developing, they can be in different 
conditions, and this can influence. They can be sharing placenta differently. Okay, and this can give rise to different environmental variations. The same can be happening in flies, because so much depends on maternal development, and we don't really know precision with which the mother uh, labels every one of the components that's necessary for egg development. So maybe eggs that make it all the way for adulthood are somehow different. So it's very hard to control, even in, in this study. So we decided to come up with an approach that would allow us to study a mutation isolated from the influences of modifiers and from the influences of environmental factors. And the idea comes from the analysis of bilaterally symmetric structures. So in all bilaterians, of course, if you don't look at left-right asymmetry and asymmetrically replaced organs, there is plenty of structures that are symmetric on two sides of the embryo. And therefore, you know that it's exactly the same individual, so the environment is the same, we can argue about it also, and the genotype is the same. Of course, there can be somatic mosaicism, but this is as close as it gets. So these are the bilateral asymmetric structures that uh, we chose. I will explain you what they are. So the first thing that I want to tell you is that what you are looking at, so, so we, we will analyze the, uh, the structure of two cells. There are plenty of these cells uh, in the larval structure. So these are what's called uh, tracheal cells. So this green structure is just a single cell. Okay, and this is a nucleus. So this is a cell that looks like a neuron. So there is one on the right side of the embryo, and very close to it, there is another one on the left side of the embryo. So this is a schematic, and these cells are very, very large. So this is 100 microns. So, so it, these are really enormous cells. So what do these cells do? So these cells are unique not only because of their external appearance, but because of their internal structures. If you section any one of these cells, you will find the lumen. It's a cytoplasmic lumen that transports oxygen from the posterior and anterior spiracles in the fly, and these cells act as shower heads. They distribute oxygen to developing tissues. So the larval surface, and the surface of the adult for that matter, is tiled with these cells that uh, act as the final points of connecting to the gas distribution system that comes from the outside and brings oxygen to developing tissues. So there are plenty of these bilaterally symmetric structures in the organism, and we will use imperfections in the structures as an assay that will tell us what can a single mutation do in exactly the same environment, in exactly the same genotype. Okay? So there are plenty of these structures. So these are seamless tubes, so in a normal cell, so if this was a neuron, you would cut it and you would see a plasma membrane and a cytoplasm. So here you see a plasma membrane, cytoplasm, another plasma membrane, and gas is coming like this. So this is absolutely a remarkable uh, structure from, from cell biological. And, and uh, we're using it as an assay, but there are plenty of excellent cell biologists, such as Maria Leptin and Jordi Casanova, that study the morphogenesis and function of these uh, structures. All right. The most important point is that every one of these cells has just a single nucleus. So it's like a tree, and if you're in a forest, and it's very difficult to distinguish trees because uh, the canopies overlap, you can tell them by looking at trunks, or in this case, by looking at nuclei. Okay. So uh, this is how, uh, this is the image of the larva in all of its glory. And you see uh, segments. This is posterior, this is anterior. So this is a terminal cell, one terminal cell it eventually has to connect to the dorsal trunk. Uh, this is a dorsal branch that connects it to the dorsal trunk. And uh, this is anastomosis. So this is really plumbing. Very, very similar. And, and the molecules that are involved in forming these structures are extremely similar to the molecules that are used in human vasculature. Okay? And the most important thing is that it's a bilaterally symmetric structure. And there are plenty of them in the organism. We are really not comparing left eye and the right eye, right? So there are many of these structures, and they're very stereotypical. What do these structures do? So this is the anatomy of what they do. They feed the body, uh, the, the, the body muscles. So the animal has to move. You need the oxygen for making ATP. Every one of these, so, where, so what, what I need to explain is that uh, there is an opening here, and oxygen leaks all the way through the lateral surface. 
So it's, the, it's, it's this irrigation device where you don't wait until you get to the terminal, right? So you, you, the oxygen enters here and then it seeps. It's like a perfusion system. It seeps through the lateral branches, all right? So it feeds the body muscles. So this is the staining for body muscles. And this is, so this is our data. And this is um, uh, uh, an EM study that shows that these body muscles are uh, flat. So these cells, in contrast to human vasculature, that is difficult to study because it is three-dimensional, not to mention the fact that you need a large number of samples. So these cells are flat, they're easy to quantify. You know, you, you, so all kinds of microanatomical features can be extracted. So these are flat two-dimensional uh, two cells, each of which contains just a single nucleus. Okay. So uh, a seminal paper from um, Mark Krasnov lab 20 years ago, okay, 20 years ago, so uh, discovered how these structures form. There is a primordium for each of the cells in the embryo. This primordium invaginates, it gets to something that is called the running man, uh, running man stage, and then they sprout out branches. And the most important point is that each branch is formed, each, each of the terminal cell is formed from a small group of cells that all compete for access to fibroblast growth factor ligand, and only one cell, one, one and only one cell, at the tip of the branch becomes the terminal cell because of combination of localized FGF signaling and lateral inhibition from notch. And we have heard about these pathways already uh, in this meeting. So this is the um, people like Mark Krasnov and Georgi Casanova dissected transcriptional circuitry. There is a cascade that goes through NET and ERK uh, molecule to X factor, we heard about the X factor from um, Ellen this morning. And then uh, there is a, a force type factor, C response factor, that marks the terminal cell and the neighboring cell uh, expresses s uh, which is a zinc finger rep uh, repressor, and the system is also controlled by a negative feedback loop. So all of these components are conserved. So what we know is that loss of negative feedback and the, the important thing is that you single out one cell from a primordium. The important thing is that it is known that loss of negative feedback gives rise to ectopic cells. So this is a mutation in sprouting, and one can vary by simultaneously labeling cytoplasm in green and nuclei in white. You, we can detect ectopic terminal cells. So this is a strong perturbation of the pathway, so the negative regulator is gone. So we decided that what we're going to do, we're going to bring our mutation, analyze the effect of our mutation. So this effect really worked. So this is the, uh, so don't look on the left hand side, these are loss of function perturbations. So in the wild type, we always see, with, with, the, with the exception of a few percent, we see just two terminal cells. In our mutants, here we see three terminal cells, here we see four terminal cells, rarely we see five terminal cells. So this is without uh, uh, these circles that should make it either easier or more complicated to see what's happening. And uh, in the rare case, we even see five terminal cells. So the important thing is that the effects are not happening simultaneously on both sides of the embryo. And from every single larva, we can collect a fraction of the cells that were affected and not affected. So this is an, an example of what we see in um, metameters of a homozygous animal. So we examined 200 animals, and there are 20 of them have defects on the left, 20 of them have defects on the right, and two have defects on both sides. So the probability works out in this case just perfectly. That these <laughs> defects are happening. Uh, yeah, that, that, that these defects are happening uh, independently of each other. So how do we think about it? Okay, so first of all, we see a significant number of measured defects. But how do we think about the segments where there are no defects? And how do we think about segments, how do we think about animals that go through development completely unskilled? I think you need to think about it in the following way. So we have a mutation. This mutation plays out only in response to the ligand activation. Ligand activation is variable. Some animal, and there are many such events, okay? Some uh, animals will have a lot of ligand, some animals will have uh, more ligand in any given signaling event. If you happen to be on the left-hand side of ligand distribution, even with high level of signaling activity, you will go through development in a normal way. So that if you have a student who is not prepared for exam, but the professor is leaving, and the student is going to pass. <laughs> yeah? And then this can happen again and again and again, and this person will graduate and eventually will become your chairman. 
<laughs> All of these things are possible. Okay? Now, so uh, I think this is the closest. I'm, I'm just, I'm done. So this is the closest that, 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 that we come to the point of analyzing the effects of mutations in a quantitative way where we have hundreds of individuals and thousands are definitely possible for multiple mutations in conditions where the genomes are identical and we can isolate the effects from the effects of mutations. So this is a study that is, so this experiment was motivated by uh, my reading about the effects of these mutations in um, collections of monozygotic twins. So this is a, uh, so this is a mutation, so this, this is a group of, uh, these are two individuals that have the same mother and father. They're monozygotic twins. They have mutation in NF1, which is a grass type component um, uh, of a signaling pathway. And there is a classification of phenotypes. One of them is scoliosis, and one of the twins has it, the other twin does not have it. Okay? So this can be used as an evidence for stochasticity. But of course, you cannot rule out somatic mosaicism. You cannot rule out different environments in uterus. But studies of such bilateral structures combined with gene editing and with quantitative imaging can do this. Okay, so these are the summaries. So is mutation sufficient to cause a phenotype? The answer is no. So we don't know if, whether you can carry out this conclusion to humans, but in flies, this, the answer is definitely no. And because all components are conserved, we believe that the same is true for species where these diseases were identified in the first place. So humans with rasopathies are escapers. Furthermore, we think that there are individual, there are carriers that are asymptomatic. Uh, so we are thinking now and we're working on developing mathematical models for incomplete penetrance and variable expressivity. And the only things that we have done so far was to analyze molecular phenotypes and structural and, structural and pattern phenotypes. But we are beginning to think about uh, assaying the flies that we generate for defects in locomotion, sleep, and learning. Thank you very much. That was fascinating question. Yes, Denise. Uh, very interesting. I, and, and you know, in, in uh, human there are many, many mutations in, uh, that affect limb morphologies, which actually give very different results in the right and on the left limbs. Yeah. And I remember the work of Amar Ama Zahar, who um, had very provocative explanations on this. I, I was just wondering if you. How, how does that relate to your work? I think that, I, I think that the origin can be exactly the same. But so, studies of monozygotic twins, uh, in many cases, people can track it down to somatic mosaics. But, but the number of these studies is so small because it needs to be a twin and it needs to carry this mutation. I would be very interested. I'm not aware of this work, but I would be interested to see. Antonio Garcia Bellido used this Aristotelian concept of continuity artifact to <laughs> sort of uh, not explain this, but to account for the fact that, in fact, it's not so important the way you reach the result that is the same. Yeah. So that so, the wild type is canalized, but the mutant is decanalized. Yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah, Jerry. Yeah. But to just follow up on that point, uh, so the, the, so the rust pathway in the, your tracheal cells is responsible for the morphology, the construction of the morphology. For specific cases, it's responsible for two things. So first of all, it is responsible before you form uh, the final uh, canopy of one tree, you specify a cell that will make the tree. On top of this, having specified the cell, during larval growth, the tree is growing. So our mutations affect both aspects, but it is much easier at this point to, to score the presence or, or absence of an extra nucleus than to quantify changes in the morphology of the tree. But, but the bilateral symmetry in the wild type is a global phenomenon. It is a global phenomenon. So why is there an upset? Because FGF is local. So, it, so the tree is forming in response to hypoxia-induced source of ligand. So each of these trees has its own source of ligand. Yeah. And, each, and uh, we believe that these sources but, but, are not but, equal. So but, but, oh, the sources are not equal. This, we, we, we believe that sources are not equal. And so we can. In, in the mutants? In the mutants and in the wild types. But in the wild type, the system is canalized. But, but, can, but I'm sorry, but, but, but where does the symmetry come from? I mean, you know, that, that's global information that is something. It is global information, but I think that in the wild type, there, is, there are plenty of feedback loops that have been tuned to account, to work, 
under settings of normal enzymes to work with noisy inputs to give you robust outputs. But again, I come back to the fact that it's global information. You're getting a global symmetry across long distances in the embryo, and that can't be... Why, I'm, uh, the question is not why is so that, there is, there are why is that upset in the mutant? Because it's suggesting that the RAS is also somehow upsetting whatever is responsible for causing because the bilateral you tune, so Because you have, a feedback, you have a feedback system that is tuned to work under uh, certain... Uh, in, with um, wild-type sensitivity to, uh, to ligand. So what is variable? is uh, how much ligand will come in response to hypoxia, right? Mm -hmm. So then the cell has a wild type enzyme to sense this hypoxic signal in immune transcription response. So all the feedback loops, priority and, and so on and so forth, have been tuned to operate for the pathway that is wild type. Once you go to a mutant, we believe that your tuning is off. And you, and you can form... I, I can believe that it would then produce, you know, too many, too many cells or uh, an exactly upset structure, happening. but I'm still puzzled about why the bilateral symmetry breaks. Bilateral symmetry is not upset. Globally, bilateral symmetry is preserved. You form extra cells with equal probability on the left and on the right. You are not... You don't generate animals that are lopsided. You generate segments that can be lopsided, but because there are multiple segments in the animal, the symmetry is still there. It's more variable, but it's still there. Okay, I didn't see that. In your... Yeah, so this is why I said that the probability works out. So we see, so if you look at any given set. So you're saying it, you're saying it works out across the population? Yes, yes, it, 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 across the population of metameters, across the 10 metameters within a single larva, and then we check it in multiple larvae. So you, you get, it's, it's symmetric, but more variable such that in the wild type we see uh, an extra cell or a missing cell in 1% of the population. So here we see in 20. That's, that's the effect. Yes? You didn't get to the necessary part. The necessary part is that we know about, the necessary part is, really, is much easier. We know about these mutations because we sequenced individuals that look the same. So, the, and we discovered that all of them have this class of mutations. So, if you have a phenotype, then you have a mutation. This is a necessary part. This is, we know, from medical geneticists. But what about the necessity of, of the phenotype? If you have, if, if, can you determine when, when the mutation is going to express itself as a phenotype? This is a sufficient condition. So, if you have a phenotype, so what happened, the way that diagnostics is done, if you look a certain way, if you are, uh, uh, you know, sugar levels are higher than something or cholesterol levels, then most likely you, are, you have this disease. So if you have a phenotype, molecular or morphological, then you have a certain disease. So, 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 if you have, so in this case, if you, have, if you look a certain way, in, in, and it's a complex of, of features, then you have a certain type of mutation. That's a necessary condition. Sufficient condition, you have a normal genome, you induce this type of mutation, you ask, will it generate a phenotype? This is sufficient. What is the condition that the mutation will generate the, the... It's a stochastic effect. What is a condition is under which... So, what is a condition in which a weak student passes the exam? <laughs> it's not guaranteed, but this can happen again and again and again and again. Is it possible to, to add some, to find a, some other factor that would account for why yes. one okay. twin had the scoliosis and the other twin didn't have It is possible, but these facts are okay. So the way, uh, I'm sure I'm not telling you anything that you don't know, but you know, scientists talk about probability when, when, and stochastic effects, when there are many effects that we cannot account for. So how can we prove, for example, that it's the ligand level that is doing this? I didn't have time to show this. So for trachea, it's not doable. For embryonic lethality, it is relatively easy because RAS pathway in the embryo ultimately is activated by uh, 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 RAS signaling in the ovary. Okay? So if we combine our, so in the wild type, embryonic lethality, let's say, is 40% or 50%. If we combine our mutation of homozygosity with heterozygous level of gherkin, we rescue it. Okay? But once again, it's, it, it's a strong perturbation, it's heterozygous. We think, yes, James. 
keep it short, please. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll ask you later, don't worry. No, yeah, I didn't want to kill the question. <laughs> Okay, and then, and then I, I, I just wanted to uh, uh, comment on a question. So in Cienegas we have uh, let 60 is RAS, and yes. uh, we have a mutation that is temperature sensitive. And um, one of the things that uh, when you have a conformational flexible mm -hmm. uh, mutation, then a lot of time the quality control system plays a major role. And we were able to show that, for example, if you express a poly Q, so overburden the cell, with an aggregation from uh, protein in one, one tissue, you would expose RAS phenotype in that mm -hmm. tissue and not in other tissues. Mm -hmm. So um, one of the things that I will put out for is to consider this as, as one of the uh, very varying effects that, that can play a role. And in that sense, um, and to take it to the, to the question, um, in, in C. elegans, RAS, of course, does patterning, and you can have multivolvine and so yeah. on when you it's play with exactly that. It's exactly the same here. Multivolvine yeah. is extra terminal cells. <laughs> And so, but one of the function which is really weird is it, it controls um, uh, a pump, a neuronal pump that uh, when you put the worms in, in uh, DDW, that the, the worms will explode because it cannot control the water influx in, in, inside the uh, um, So this is an activity, it's not a, a program. So I was wondering if, if, if you have such phenotype. This is why we're interested in physiological phenotypes. Yeah. Because and these humans do not only look differently, they learn differently. They have problems with sleep, they have problems with pain perception. So we're, we are just beginning to look into it, but it took you know, several years to make this work. Thank you. Thank you very much.